College in Motion on this August the 10th. Uh, we have a great program for you this morning because we have with us our old friend, Dan Dennison, a historian that's come to visit us again. Dan, welcome to Channel 6. And Thank you for having me. Get us started on what we're going to talk about, but I think uh, tell us what we saw there at the beginning. Maybe that'll get us started into the program, Dan. Well, well that is a, a lithograph uh, that was uh, drawn by the famous uh, cartoonist Thomas Nast uh, in uh, November of 1861. It was when he was a, a very young uh, reporter. And uh, essentially, uh, in the mid-19th uh, century, you communicated with the public by lithographs. Yeah. And so that... And what was it depicting very briefly? The this was a the largest uh, review in the, in the North America up to that date. And it was uh, to show President Lincoln that the Union Army was ready to fight. Okay, all right. That's, that, and that's the subject of our program today, right? So get, right. Get us started now. What, what, what period are we talking about and what well, led up to all this, Dan? Well, uh, uh, in November of uh, 1860, if we, we look at the slides, uh, President Lincoln was, was starting a, a very challenging experience uh, because uh, essentially the southern states said that um, if you elect President Lincoln, we will succeed from the Union. Uh, the issue of uh, slavery uh, versus non-slavery had, had, had come to a boiling point. And uh, so uh, uh, by uh, January, seven states had succeeded. Uh, next slide. And uh, uh, this was out of 36 states in the Union. And they were the Confederate states, next slide, uh, were uh, forming their government in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, and that even in January, they were taking forts uh, that were previously occupied by the Union Army. Uh, one of these was at Fort Sumter in the harbor of uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And then by April, uh, this came to a head and the uh, South Carolina... Uh, is that Fort Sumter now, Bernie? Th that is, yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, and they fired on it and eventually uh, Major Anderson and his troops were relieved, but as, essentially the war was joined at this point. Okay. Uh, next slide. And th here locally, uh, things didn't happen until about May when uh, Colonel Ellsworth, a friend of the Lincoln family, uh, led the, the Union troops into Alexandria. Uh, he saw this Confederate flag flying at the Marshall House. He went up, he tore it down, and he was shot immediately by the, uh, the gentleman who owned the place, yeah. and he in turn was shot. And so that was the beginning, this is Marshall House, uh, of the war here locally. Um, then after that, uh, there was pressure on both sides, north and south, to take the uh, offensive, and uh, uh, General Irwin Dow was, uh, was uh, directed by President Lincoln to, uh, to strike the Confederate forces at Manassas, and this took place in July. Uh, it was ill-conceived. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, Irwin, Irvin McDowell. Uh, he's a hefty he, looking guy. Well, he, he's a little, the image does, doesn't do him justice here, but uh, uh, he, uh, he started a retreat, the retreat became a rout, and uh, he lost his job after that. And then the, this is uh, the bridge at, uh, at, at Bull, over Bull Run, and the next slide is uh, Henry House at, at Manassas. This is kind of like the culmination of the battle. Uh, afterwards, uh, General George McClellan was, uh, took charge, and then he was given the command of uh, get these troops in order. And so, next slide. 
uh, he spent all his time training them and uh, equipping them. So right now, if you'd hold this at this point, this is uh, a, a picture of Thomas Nass when he was midlife, but the, the lithograph that I showed you at the beginning of the program is when he was 21 years old. He was a, essentially a cub reporter, uh, but he was very skilled. Who, who did he work for? Which, which he way? worked for uh, Harper's yeah, Harper, uh, Weekly, Harper, yeah, yeah. and he worked for several uh, publishing houses, very skilled uh, artist. And that essentially what happened is, is that you, he did, you draw your artwork and it gets converted into blocks that becomes the printing process. In fact, you'll see in some of these images uh, little seams. That's where the blocks come well, what together. What is that actually, Dan? Thomas Nast is famous for many things. He gave us Santa Claus as we know him today. Really? Before Thomas Nast, Santa Claus looked totally different. And, and he gave him uh, the look that we know. Like what? We had different images of Santa Claus? Yes, yes and, we did. And he's the one that what? He essentially first? made the American Santa Claus. Really? And that he also was a uh, political cartoonist. He, he brought down the Tweed uh, organization in New York. Next slide. Um, and then he also gave us uh, the Republican elephant and the Democratic donkey. What, was he was he affiliated with any particular party, or was he sort of neutral? predominantly Republican? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, President Lincoln said he is the the best recruiting sergeant we have. Oh, really? Just because he was very powerful uh, images, and then to give you an, an idea here of uh, of this is more advanced. Yeah, we can show that. Work. Okay, hold it. Yes. And essentially, he, he, he really uh, had a high degree of skill in his artwork, and he, he had a, a rather cutting uh, point to his cartoons. Yeah, that's very nice, Jeff. Hold, keep it up there a little sure. bit. Show it a little bit. He can go through it a little bit. Just show it. Yeah. Yeah, those are really nice. This was later in life yeah. when, when he uh, was taking on the politicians who were taking yeah. apart the United States Army. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Okay, Dan, that's that's good. Now, uh, tell we're we're going to be talking about the Grand Review, but uh, which which uh, and you'll explain that. But the the how did this how did the idea come about? Why have all this that we're going to well talk about? I, I, again? So give us uh, a little more background there that, at the time. Well, um, at at the time. Um, and we're talking the, the Union Army was trying to get its act together, yeah. and uh, it had several uh, reviews during the fall of uh, 1861, and uh, it. Uh, By reviews, we're talking about a bunch of soldiers together marching in front of someone. Absolutely, yeah. it was a parade. Of parade, a, yeah, okay. The Grand Review had 70,000 troops. Uh, almost a hundred regiments. Yeah. It had uh, cavalry. It had uh, artillery. Why did why did they come, why did they want to do this at this time? I mean, who thought about? It? Do we know that? This was a, a basically to sell George McClellan. This was George McClellan going to his president saying that our troops are ready to fight, oh. and, and I, we're sh we're going to show you. That they're ready to fight. Oh, so that really that's that was the motivation of, of the whole thing. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And uh, um, I would like to, if we go to the next, uh, uh, let me see a slide that they yeah. had. There. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What was the next slide on that one? We had the cartoon. Okay. There. We, yeah, okay. We'll hold. We'll be talking about Julia Ward Howe in a minute. Yeah. But right now, I'd like to go to, to this map. Yeah. Go to this map and show you how. President Lincoln made it the eight miles to Bailey's Crossroads. And this is a, an 1861 map. And if we okay. go right here, if you can zoom in at, towards the White House. Yeah, that's great. Right oh. there would have been the Washington Canal. Washington was going to be a, a Venice. It was going yeah. to have canals. Keep your pointer up there, Dan. Yeah, so that's and, right uh, there. Yeah, and where is the White House? Right, right over right here on right the other side there. of the ellipse. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. And uh, so the, the president would have crossed the canal and would have come to Long Bridge. And then... Well, Long Bridge is what bridge now? It's the 14th Street Bridge. Okay. And it was... Uh, and that it was, was there then? It was there then. It was guarded. At the other side of uh, 14th Street Bridge was something called Fort Runyon. And it's a five-sided uh, structure protecting the bridge uh, heading towards Alexandria and Arlington. Okay, and that would have been where on today's map? What, what, what's it would have been right at the bridgehead, uh, uh, short of the Nash Pentagon, close to the Pentagon, okay. but right near the Columbia Yacht Marina. Okay. And uh, uh, so then the, the next thing that they would have done, he would have gone to uh, the toll gate. Oh, and, and I'd just like to tell you this, that uh, the Columbia Turnpike yeah. was, was uh, created in 1812. It's one of the oldest roads in the United States. Really? And that uh, at, at the time, uh, they would charge someone 50 cents to, to ride a carriage across the Columbia Turnpike. Across up until a turn, not not water. No, just a, to go down the road, and this would be a a dirt and gravel road, about one lane wide, and that would be the road, and uh, it was it was a considerable innovation, and it was created because Washington had no we'll access. Get back on the map here, yeah. Had no had no access to the west, and so they said, if you're going to have Washington D.C., you need a road that goes west. And so they built it. And how far west did it go? It went all the way to the to, uh, Little I, River Turnpike, which is Route 7. Okay. Uh, went, uh, actually, over it, believe it or not. Over it? Yeah, beyond it. Yeah, okay, yeah, so, okay. But it was to connect with it. And uh, so on this, on this trip, the next place that he went to would have been something called Hunter's Chapel, and Which, wh where's that today? Today, that would be Glebe Road and Columbia Pike. Okay. It would be where the Westmont Shopping Center is. Yeah. And uh, Rosenthal's. And then he would proceed on to something called Arlington Mill. And that would be four, four mile run, stream, and yeah. the railroad right here. And it's, yeah. and it's still pretty much the same. And then finally, he would go beyond Carlin Spring Road to this place called Bailey's Crossroads, and that would be eight miles. And that's where that's where Route Seven and uh, Route Fifty. Route Seven and and uh, Arlington Fiscal. and Columbia Pike meet. It would not be where Arlington. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's how you how he would 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 get there, and, and then. Uh, and obviously, at that time, it was just what open fields and. Open fields, farmland. Yeah. And uh, at the time, uh, uh, this was November 20th. Yeah. So the, the temperature had just turned cold. Well, there was snow on you. the ground. And uh, the troops, uh, they were coming from basically 240 forts around Washington. The, f the farthest distance that they traveled was Drainsville. And they, they started their trips, oh, like uh, four and five o'clock in the morning to get to Bailey's Crossroads. Marching. And then they had, uh, and their, their commanders, they wanted to show off their new uniforms with the brass and the, the, the buttons and everything. Uh, so they, uh, they did not uh, want them to wear coats. And the temperature was cold. Yeah. And also, they didn't bother to feed them all that entire day. So they were, they were there pretty much uh, from early morning till uh, uh, late in the afternoon. Yeah. And uh, another thing that happened was that between 20,000 and 30,000 uh, uh, spectators attended. And it, uh, it was, it was a considerably uh, auspicious event to see uh, how the military had improved, and th and that was the basic purpose of why why General, was it General McClellan? Absolutely. Say? Why he why he did that? Now where 
Where were the where were the rebel forces, the, the Confederacy at this time? Believe it or not, they were there too. And the problem. Well, well when you say there too, what is, what does that mean? Uh, say where, where Annandale, at Annandale, they were on the fringes of this event, and depending on who you read, um, they um, they wanted to weigh in on this event as well, and uh, mean participate. Absolutely by causing a ruckus around the edges to cause the event to be uh, broken up early. That's what yeah. they wanted to do. So, and uh, uh, so, uh, yes, they were there. It's it's really it, it seems almost incredible that here you have two forces. But what, get us again. Where, when was the Battle of Manassas in relation? That was to this? like. Uh, July 21st, and this was like November 20th. So it's after after both battles of Manassas? Absolutely, and this is also after the, the Union defeat at the Battle of Ball's Bluff in October. So yeah. the Union was not doing very well, no. even though they were putting on a, a good face for this parade. Yeah. They, uh, they, they were having some rough times. Uh, and do, do, do we, uh, I, I don't want to beat this one to death, but do we have, in in what fashion did the Confederates communicate there that they wanted to be in on this thing? Essentially, they would. How did they, they do that? According to uh, Julia Ward Howe's account of it years later, yeah. she said that she saw a detachment of Union uh, cavalry respond out to the distance uh, to. Uh, 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 firings, yeah. uh, and that uh, the the Union cavalry intervened and, and saved the, these soldiers out on the periphery. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, she said it. It's sure a good story. It's it's an incredible story. Yeah. But also, there's other stories too, and I'll I'll get into it. I'd like to go to Julia Ward Howe now. Okay. She uh, she was a a an abolitionist lady from Massachusetts. She was a writer and a poet. She would have been a, uh, uh, an activist in the 20th century uh, that would have gotten the women the vote. Uh, she was active in, in any number of, of areas. Her husband, next slide. Yeah. Get the next slide. Yeah, sure get it. This is a picture of her uh, later in life. Uh, next slide. This is her husband, Samuel Gridley Howe. He was an educator. He, he started a school for the blind in Massachusetts. And they were in town to uh, help establish an organization called the Sanitary Commission, which was probably, we would call it the American Red Cross today, but it was a totally different organization. But it was to help uh, the the wounded and the sick uh, from the from the war uh, on the uh, on the union, union side. side on the union side, yeah. and then with them was a James Friedman Clark who was uh, their minister, and uh, they uh, rode out to the the review, and uh, they uh, participated in it, and then on the way back. They got caught in the traffic. You know, there's only so many roads yeah. that you can go back to Washington. Yeah, on. and you're basically talking about people with their carriages. Their carriages, horses, horses walking. And, and walking, yeah. And uh, so they were surrounded by a group of uh, soldiers singing the song, John Brown's Body Lies a Molding in the Grave. And they, they would, all of them would sing it. And so this Reverend Clark turned to Mrs. Howe and said, Julia, surely you could come up with a nicer set of words than, than this. Yeah. And uh, so she... Uh, and just remind us again, what, who was John Brown again, very uh, briefly? Uh, John Brown, in, in October 16th, 1859, attacked uh, the arsenal at Harper's, Harpers Ferry. Ferry. And he was going to create an insurrection uh, that would uh, start a rebellion of all of the slaves, yeah. but uh, it didn't last very long. And mm -hmm. by December, he was found guilty for treason and he was hung. And so, 
the abolitionists, and particularly the radical abolitionists, considered him a hero. Yeah. And so they, they created this song. Now, did Julie, did she compose the John Brown's fight? No, she did not. Did Somebody not. else did. Yeah, okay. And yeah, it was, a, ahead. It was a, a more bass song than, yeah. the, than the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Yeah, but she, oh, but yeah. she went back to the Willard Hotel, and she was so awe-inspired by everything she had seen that day uh, that, that um, in the middle of the night, the words came to her, and that my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Now, did she did she do the the, the musical part? The or music, just, just the, the musical the part, part was was uh, even John Brown's body lies molding in a grave comes from the tune called "On Canaan's Shore," written in 1856. Okay. So the so, so she adapted it to adapted that too. Adapted it, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, after that, uh, she submitted it to, to Atlantic Monthly. They paid her the grand sum of four dollars for her poem, and immediately published it in uh, February of 1862. And it became an immediate hit. It uh, it became the anthem for the Union in in the rest of the Civil War. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And uh, she, she did, had, had, had she had she ever had she written anything else that became famous? Nothing like this. Of Believe course, it or not, uh, others would say that it has. But my take on it is that this was the high point of her career. Yeah. She even admitted this was a gift. This was this this happened to her, yeah. and she couldn't explain it. But it uh, it was it was very much the high point of her her career. How did she? I guess again, I don't not be able. The the she she composed the the words, and then how did it come about that that the tune that she picked? Uh, did she? Uh, they immediately they had the tune first, and so they just applied the words to it, okay. and then they had did different different versions of it, yeah. and uh, yeah. and it became very popular, yeah. and. Uh, uh, so uh, I would I would I would say that uh, if you would take uh, Dixie, and if you would take uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, those are the two songs that are synonymous with the, with the Civil War. Even yeah. though there are many others. Yeah. Then uh, before we we, we 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 have a few more minutes, but we didn't we didn't have yes. show anything drop, on drop that back picture five over years. there. Like, Explain Just, that a little bit. Here's your yes. point. So this, is this, this is, another lithograph? This from, is a lithograph uh, from Harper's that has been colorized. And this okay. is the Treasury Department. And these are ladies leaving the Treasury Department in uh, 1864. And this shows several things. Number one, uh, this is the first uh, example of of women working for the federal government, the women in the civil service yeah. being shown. Uh, also, it's the first example of sexual harassment in the federal government. There's more story to this. Really, and, and, and is that is that it, it, who who did the lithograph? Did our our the 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 supervisors at the Treasury Department were relatively unscrupulous, and these were uh, like w uh, wives and widows of of uh, Union soldiers. Yeah. And that they were, they uh, were put upon as they worked. And, really. And then there's another thing that and the reason why I I show this is that even at this time, uh, these ladies, even though she they worked at the Treasury Department uh, every day, they couldn't find housing any closer than Baltimore, so they came to work every day by train from Baltimore. Oh my. And so, so that is is an example of it. And uh, lithography in the 19th century became literally an art form. And so, this yeah. this is uh, another aspect of it. But at the time, uh, life was pretty tough uh, in Northern Virginia. Uh, if you didn't uh, take care of your chickens or your orchard, uh, you'd starve. Uh, if you you had no rights, essentially the rights you had as an American citizen went away. 
during the war. Uh, what, go explain that a little bit more when, in Northern Virginia. In, they, in Northern Virginia, you were in an occupied zone of the, of the Union Army. Uh, if, if an accusation was made against you, you could be brought in and uh, put in jail. You could have, uh, literally, uh, if you owned any building, it could be confiscated, uh, particularly if it was a, uh, a church, a barn, a house, or whatever. So they, uh, and that, that, that included, you know, could, could people move in then at that time or just everybody, everything remained stable? The, the, the people were not allowed to move yeah. unless, without permission. Uh, if the big threat was that you would have your property confiscated and uh, uh, churches were known to be cha converted into stables. Um, and uh, this was all because of, uh, all because of the fighting, or the absolutely. This yeah. was this was this was the front. Yeah, there all of the activity was going on right here. Well, and I guess in some ways that would that would make some sense. And in a way, that they're going to although he's, it seems rather strange. But let yeah. I me mean, just hop back again to 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 the to the women there. That uh, what what uh, what else were they uh, what what else were they fighting for? Besides, what, what actually, because it's rather bold move, it seems, at that time. For them to work? Yeah. It was a necessity yeah. because all of the men were, were, were gone. gone, drafted, yeah. whatever. And then the, the risk that you had in, if you were lived in the district is all your food came from Maryland and Virginia. Yeah. And so if, if Maryland and Virginia is, is cut off, uh, you're isolated. And then also there was considerable apprehension uh, as to what was the next bad thing that was going to happen to us. Yeah. Will uh, the government be able to protect me, whatever government it is? Yeah. So it, it was a very uh, uh, tense time. Yeah. So. Dan, we're down about, I guess, around three minutes or so. Hop back to the actual review. Mm -hmm. How long did it actually take for, for these? You had 70,000 troops plus uh, it, the civilians. And the, formal, the formal part of the review was from about 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, the, the preparation was from uh, well into the morning, but it, there were some troops that were still on the field uh, late at night. And did Lincoln stay there the whole time he, he, with his cabinet? He, to my knowledge, he did not. He stayed during the during the formal part of the review yeah. and was gone by five o'clock. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, and the 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 rough part for the troops was that the, the day started uh, cold and blustery. It ended in a drizzling rain. Oh, really? And so the hospitals were filled. Yeah. At uh, at the end of the end of the event. It, yeah. was, it, was, it was a pretty tough. Yeah, it really was. And, and, and then I, I guess after, after the review, the, the troops were all d disposed again. And they, they went to their various uh, forts and posts. And by the way, if you were going to see an example of a Civil War fort in Northern Virginia, the place to go is Fort Ward in Alexandria. It is extremely well preserved. And where, and it, where is that actually located, it's, uh, roughly? It's, uh, it's off of uh, Route 7 behind the Bradley Shopping Center. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's near the Episcopal High School. Yeah. And it, it is an excellent example of a Civil War fort. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm trying to think. Uh, I think we've covered it pretty well. At, uh, uh, well, if, if we can go into the... The legacy. Okay, yeah, we're down to two minutes now. So, the 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 essentially the the Battle Hymn of the Republic has taken numerous uh, lives. Uh, it, was, it was very popular during the Civil War. Uh, it was also very popular during World War II. Um, the Civil Rights Movement uh, embraced it. And uh, uh, more recently, uh, you can hear it in the Ken Burns production, The, C the Civil War. And uh, uh, even uh, in 2001, uh, it, 
was resurrected after the 9-11 the disaster. Uh, at the service at the National Cathedral, uh, which was attended by both President Bush and uh, President Clinton, former President Clinton, um, they sang it there. Oh yeah. So it 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 does continue. Oh yeah, it's probably the the, the, the most stirring hymn that we have. And then really. uh, and then another <laughs> uh, time, uh, you would see that John Philip Sousa. Uh, had versions of it with Dixie as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, there, there's the uh, the Mormon Tabernacle has a tremendous version. Very much. Of it. Well, yeah. It's, it's a that, in fact, quite frankly, that's my favorite. Yeah. It is, is the with a full orchestra. Yeah. Well, when I when we were looking for things, I I, I happened to listen to it again yesterday also. And it's it's tremendous. If you haven't seen it. Okay. We're and folks, we're gonna hear it in our. In the background, as we close, don't run away, Dan. We're going to close this thing here, but uh, you'll hear the battle hymn in public in the background as we're going into our announcements here. <laughs>